to pick one. Yeah. 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 Like we had, a, we had uh, some space sides that were like this expensive space sides, and everybody's question. Yeah. 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 It's like uh, over $300, and I was like, yeah, yeah, to keep it down to yeah, 25 yeah, bucks, we're yeah, kind of like just yeah. trying to figure it out. So we got to go over here. Oh, this one's a cheap one. Uh, and this blend is a nice, affordable blend. Uh, 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 I take all the other ones are just for my patient myself, so I'm not paying. I've seen what the guys do. We have this at our store. We have a version of this. We have 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 this. I just missed it. It was like, you know what? It was. The guy that was there, 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 the guy people who are going to be a little late, so yeah. let's see where they end up having to sit. Awesome. Okay, well now we have complete silence. So thank you everybody for coming. This is our autumnal offer offerings of 2023. Uh, of course, this is Mike Tucker's house, so everybody say hello to Mike. He's our host of the evening. Uh, thank you for having us. Heat up. Anybody needs the bathroom? There's one up the stairs just to the left, and there's one down the stairs just to the left. Yeah, yeah, bathroom's important. Um, so today we are focusing on regions of Scotland. We have something from everywhere. Uh, we have the Highlands, the Lowlands, Campbelltown, Speyside, Isla, and one that's not an actual designated region called the islands, and that's going to be our talisker tonight. Uh, I think eventually it might end up turning out to be the islands, but islands around an island, because Scotland's an island. Um, there's just this whole, this whole, the whole west coast of, of Scotland is just island after island after island. Uh, so it's hard to kind of just take all of those islands all over Scotland and just put them in one region because they're so spread out. Uh, so I don't know if they're actually ever going to make it an actual region, but we consider it a region. Okay, um, so we're going to go through also a nice little blend, which is going to cover most Highland whiskeys, this particular one, um, and then going through ex-bourbon barrels, sherry casks, and peated expressions as well. So we're going to taste pretty much everything that Scotland has to offer in some way, shape, or form, some type of barrel, um, getting used uh, for all of these whiskeys. Um, so our very first one is going to be the Compass Box. Uh, this, this particular whiskey is called Orchard House. Compass Box always bottles their whiskeys at 46% ABV, unless it's higher or cask strength. Uh, but they're, they're blending, so all the casks kind of blend in together and you don't get a, a de definite cask strength, it's just whatever the blend ends up being. And they'll proof it down, typically down to your 46%. Uh, to spread that out a bit. So this one's really neat. Compass Box is founded by a gentleman named John Glazer. He used to work for Johnny Walker. So he has Diageo's portfolio ingrained in his mind. He knows what everything about Diageo brands are going to taste like. Uh, and I think he's found a couple perfect examples of Diageo through Kleinlish. And Kalila, he uses both of those quite often in his blends. Kleinlish, in particular, it's a Highland distillery. Um, I think it's actually a space egg. Um, but it's known as the Waxy Distillery. We don't have a Kleinlish to try tonight, uh, except for over, I think, over 40% of this whiskey is two different age statements of Kleinlish. But it's, it's known as the Waxy Distillery. And it's, it's all because of the, the, the way they, the, they distill their spirit. It goes through uh, what's called worm tubs, not unlike what most Diageo brands like Talisker have in their distilleries. And worm tubs is just a sequence of tons and tons of copper wire or copper piping uh, that condenses the spirit and it gives us this really cool, oily, meaty texture. Um, and 
Kleinlish has figured out how to just get it to be nice and sticky and just mouth coating. Uh, so it's waxy to the palate. Uh, and that, I think, is why he uses it for most of his blends. It just allows all the other whiskies to stick to the Kleinlish and it becomes the heart of your, your blend. And then everything else is just complimenting how awesome Kleinlish is. If you guys didn't know, I really like Kleinlish. Um, so this one, this one is made up very, very much so of a lot of first fill bourbon barrels. Uh, they're using Kleinlish, they're using some Linkwood, they're using Ben Rennes. There's a parcel of a blended whiskey all on its own that's a Highland blend, so who knows what went into that particular one. Uh, but also uh, some, some Aberlauer, which is the only whiskey that actually has a sherry barrel influence on this one. So we're going to notice a lot of uh, you know, vanillas and, and caramels, all the beautiful things that come from a uh, bourbon barrel. But it's, it's called Orchard House. So we're gonna we're gonna see a lot of those apples. We might see peaches, nectarines, anything that grows in an orchard. Really, you can maybe expect to, to get some flavors of those. Um, lastly, oh, compass box. What was I gonna say? Their website is awesome. Uh, they will tell you right down to the percentile uh, what whiskeys or what barrels of certain age stated whiskeys are going into their blends. Um, it's all on a really neat little graph, and the, if you're looking at one of their graphs, uh, it has so it basically rings like a tree, um, and each one of those rings is representing a year, so you can easily see what parcel is at what age, and then it's going to give you a percentage, like a pie chart almost, of exactly what's going into that particular blend. Uh, so it's, it's really cool. They're very transparent as a blending house. That's why we really only want to try compass boxes when it comes to a blend. Per personally, uh, maybe as a group, we've, we've done doers before. We've done other blends before, but compass box is always one of those ones. If you close your eyes, you, you're probably going to not know which one was the blend if you tried everything blind because it just competes so well with our single malts anyways. And this is a blended malt, so there's no other grains going into this particular whiskey anyways. So their website is certainly worth a check out if you are new to whiskey. Uh, they have very, very informative videos from John Glazer, who is the, uh, the owner. Uh, and it just goes through how cool barrels are, because all of these whiskeys have influence from their barrels. All whiskey is, is getting the majority of their flavor from those barrels, um, be it ex-bourbon, new oak, or any type of sherry that you can get. Um, that's a huge component of the color of the whiskey, as well as your flavor profiles. So we can expect lots of cool ex-bourbon notes from this guy, and then we're gonna kind of gradually talk about all the other whiskeys as we go. Now, before we start sipping, uh, we had a lot of, we had a, we've, we've been very, very lucky, very fortunate as a, as a whiskey group to have a lot of support from our sponsors. So you'll see special thanks to Beam Suntory uh, this month. Um, we've got, we've got so much helping hands. We've got, we've got, uh, we've got Glenn Allecky here from Derek uh, and he's a, he's a rep, I want to say unique again. Is it unique? Authentic. Authentic, authentic <laughs> wine and spirits. Uh, he's, he carries Glen Allecky, he also carries Compass Box, as well as Gordon McPhail uh, and Ben Rolnick. Uh, and just, just some, some beautiful whiskeys in his portfolio. Sadly, Manitoba Liquor Mart says their head straight up their butt and they don't really put too much of their products on his shelves. Who do you work uh, for? <laughs> What's that? Who do you work for again? Uh, I work for the Winnipeg Whiskey Club. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we're all about we're all about wicked whiskeys, and we're gonna have well, seven and now eight delicious whiskeys to try. So I hope you guys enjoy your night. Thank you all for coming. Um, if you can't make an event, we've got nine people who couldn't make it tonight. So if you ever see a lineup that you like, you like the price tag on it, but you can't come, you can always commit to the event and to samples. Um, we, we always pour half ounce samples for all the people who have never been here before uh, and that's mainly to keep everybody safe driving home uh, and also just so we're not getting too sloshed in somebody else's house. Um, 
and that's all you really need to try everything. It's enough to try and, 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 and make a really good judgment on if you want to buy that bottle. Uh, I've got so much things to say. Should I just wait for later and just drink now? Yeah, 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 yeah okay. <laughs> we'll talk about more stuff yeah. after. So let's just cut this box. Okay. We'll take a, take, we'll try to do 15 minutes per whiskey here. Yeah. yeah. Going to a lower strength. So this is one of our lower strength whiskeys. This is the Ockintosh 12 year old. It's at 40% ABV. And this is the beginning of the regions of Scotland. So this is a lowland distillery. Uh, there's not a heck of a lot of distilleries in the lowlands. Um, there's Auchintosh and there's a, the, the, the newly redeveloped Rosebank, which, which you know, they, they were like all, almost a mothball distillery, which means that they've closed down and had barrels and they were just sitting aging. And now they've started production again. Um, there's a lot of grain distilleries down in the, in the lowlands for for use in blends, and uh, and a couple of newer newer ones, Kings Barn. Um, what else? I wrote them down here. Uh, we've got Inch, Inch Dairy, Lindor's Abbey, Ardgowan, the Gervan, which is a grain distillery. Gladnock is another one. Uh, Daft Mill is a distillery that I don't think you see much of, but there's a lot of independent bottlings, which means a, 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 a bottler has purchased barrels and put it under their own name, not unlike, we don't have any ideas. Yeah, SMWS, so like something like this. These guys don't own a distillery, they just own a bunch of barrels from a lot of distilleries and then they release them under their own name with the, you know, with the either the distillery advertised or not. Uh, so Akintoshin is one of our whiskies tonight that is outside of the normal distilling methods where they triple distill their whiskies. Uh, that'll, that'll provide a softer spirit. The more time you distill the spirit, the softer it gets. You also lose flavor uh, the more you distill, but of course the barrels come into play. So they're using 80% bourbon barrels and 20% sherry bar barrels, playing between Oloroso sherries and Pedro Jimenez sherries. Um, they were founded in 1823. It says right on their little thingy here. You know, they like the lots of these distilleries like to say when they're founded because they're all almost 200 years old or more. Um, and it's a Beam Centauri product. So this one, uh, this one's interesting. We have three Akintoshin and then one like stupidly expensive Akintoshin in Manitoba um, and on occasion we get the 18 year old as well so we have a we have the 12 year old there's a, a triple wood which is quite nice actually uh, and then there's a, a, a non-age statement new oak they're all under $70 typically and then they've got this $600 to 20 some odd year old one uh, that would probably be cheaper in Alberta so that is your Akintoshin. Uh, I find that lowland distilleries kind of get a bad rap. There's not a lot of them. Uh, and because they're kind of just, you know, they're the bottom feeder of Scotland, you know, I don't consider them that, but, but that could be what people do. Uh, there's, there's just not a lot of whiskies to go around. Glen Kinchy is one that particular distillery that's really excellent. Um, Everdower's good. Everdower's a Highland though. I don't think it's a lowland. I think it's south, isn't it? I think it's still in the Highlands, though. It's in Pitla Creek. Where's Pitla Creek? Enter down where it's silent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Pitmark Creek, is it? Yeah. That's yeah. Highland. That's the Highlands? You're at the difference of height. Yeah, there's, like, the Highlands are gigantic. <laughs> the, the Highlands is the much. biggest region of Scotland. Um, you know, like, Glen Goyne is another distillery uh, that we carry in town. Uh, that is right on the cusp of the highlands and the lowlands. So, you know, when I was trying to figure out exactly how many distilleries are in the lowlands, Glen Goyne popped up, but it's still a highland distillery. Uh, so it's just right on the border. Uh, and it, of course, it you know it doesn't end up mattering. Mattering it doesn't actually matter because uh, if the whiskey's good, it is good. So. Akintosh, 12 year old, triple distilled, 40%, a little bit of bourbon, a little bit of sherry for you guys, uh, and maybe a little bit of funk. There's a, there's a little bit of funk I, I find with Akintosh, which is uh, I just take it or leave it, right? So there you go. My opinion is, of course, this, uh, this one isn't as dark as their triple wood, but 
nowhere on their bottles do they say that it's natural color. So you can always assume if it's not pointed out on the label that it is not natural color because it doesn't take too much, you know, it doesn't take too much time to put the font on the label saying it's natural color to cover your butt, right? So if they don't, they have no reason to be covering their butt. The triple wood or the three wood that they call it is is darker than this glenallochy, which is natural color, just a sherry bomb. And there, and the Akintoshin is like a like cola. So you can tell that they, you know, they're, they're putting some caramel coloring in there. We're uh, $120 cheaper than Kennison Wine Market for that Akintoshin. Get out of here. No. The, so uh, $7.89 the, the, versus $6.69 here. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's a, and that's a funny thing. We have, uh, we have a couple bean products. Yeah, we got more than a couple. We got four. Uh, we got four Beam Suntory products here. Uh, these guys here. And Bowmore is included in that as well. And those are quite well priced for Manitoba. I, I think whenever I look at Alberta pricing, uh, where, you know, for your information, who, have, who hasn't ordered with us before, we have lots of discounts in Ottawa, uh, in, uh, available to us in Alberta. So we are, as a group, if you're on our WhatsApp page for our chat line there, uh, we put together orders and uh, share shipping to, to get whiskeys brought in that you can't get in Manitoba from Alberta. Um, so. If you ever want to jump on that, you just uh, you can leave your name and number uh, with me at the end of the night, and we can add you to the WhatsApp group if you guys want to be part of that. And it's just we're just a bunch of nerds, anyways, talking about whiskey all night, anyways. But uh, we do sometimes set up orders and then uh, get whiskey for cheaper and a little bit more selection. You can get this in Alberta, which is where we got it. So Beam Centauri. These guys here, all of their pricing is, seems to be really well priced in Manitoba and not in Alberta. So there's there's some products that actually aren't worth buying in Alberta and the, and Beam Centauri products are one of them. What about that $50,000 bottle of Bowmore? What? Oh, sure. Yeah, right? It's oh. probably 55 or 60 in, <laughs> in Alberta. Like we've got, uh, what do we have? We have the, right now the one that's more attainable than that is the Bowmore 22 Aston Martin and I think it's... Maybe seven ninety nine here, but it's easily eight hundred and forty dollars in Alberta, plus shipping, plus a little bit of tax. So you're you're already paying more from Alberta, which is not not the norm. McAllen is expensive everywhere, and that's just Edmonton being there. Pretty so I suppose. A little north, now, the Highlands is definitely the biggest region. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have the most distilleries in it, uh, but this is Glengarry. Glengarryek is how it reads, but it's pronounced Glengarry. Uh, this is the Renaissance. It's an 18-year-old whiskey. So this is our, actually our oldest whiskey of the night. Uh, this is when we jump out of the 40% and, and start hanging out into the 50%ers. Um, so this one, there's there's not a heck of a lot of information, sadly, about Glengarry, um, except for it's uh, from Aberdeenshire, where there's only about 2,000 people, uh, and it's one of the oldest distilleries in Scotland. So it was founded in 1797. Um, the oldest distilleries in Scotland typically do come from the Highlands. Uh, save for one. So the second oldest distillery in Scotland, actually sorry, the, the very first oldest distillery in Scotland is Glen Turret. That's a Highland distillery. Then we go to Bowmore, which is all the way on Isla, which is my favorite region, because I'm a, just a big peat head. Uh, I named my daughter Isla, the same spelling as well. I got permission from my wife. It was awesome. Uh, then Strath Isla, 1786. Bal Blair, if you were at my house in June, you tried a hell of a lot of years of Bal Blair. Uh, and then, believe it or not, Oban is, uh, is a, a, in the top five of the oldest distilleries. So, uh, definitely a really cool history. It's changed hands many times and then came back as a, as a, as a really kind of 
pushing their product type of distillery in the 90s. Um, and this is the Renaissance. So as you can see, we're probably looking at uh, some bourbon barrels and sherry casks for sure. With the color, the sherry is going to be coming through on this one. This is a PX. Right, PX sherry. Um, so, you know, this one, this one was a, an extremely good value when it came out. Uh, I think even even the first time it was released in in Winnipeg, they screwed up on the price and you could get it for under hundred dollars. Wow. I think it was an eighty dollar bottle at first. They figured their stuff out, and now I think it sits at about one hundred and thirty. Um, this is the last of the series of the Renaissance series where they're basically trying to show the distillery character, but that's literally what the website says: is that we're trying to show our distillery character. And they don't tell you anything more. Um, so we'll let the whiskey do the talking. A uh, little bit of bourbon, sherry casks. It doesn't say matured in a sherry cask, so that's where you can go ahead and do your assumptions, your hypothesis, or your educated guesses on what kind of barrels are aging this whiskey. Um, if it doesn't, if it's not a whiskey that says fully matured in something, that's a selling feature. That is that is money. That is. That is why I would buy a bottle uh, if it says first fill or if it says matured solely in something. So if you see a whiskey that's that color, you can assume sherry. If it's a Highland distillery, you can assume maybe a little bit of sherry influence for sure, but that's not a rule. Uh, but also if it does not say matured solely in something, you can always assume that it's maybe got a little bit of its age statement from a bourbon barrel. Because those are the easiest to acquire, easy to forget about for 18 years and then finish something that they found in the warehouse in a nice sherry cask and then sell it for a hundred and some odd bucks. So this, this guy here is sitting at how many percentage? 50.2% alcohol. Now 18 years in a barrel is going to mellow the, a whiskey out pretty, pretty well where you know you might not notice the, the ABV burn or anything like that. But if you do take a cap of your, uh, from your water, put a couple drops in there and just drop it into your whiskey and open it up a little bit. Give it a little swirl if you need to or let it sit for a while. Typically these, well these whiskeys have been uh, sitting in the in our glasses for maybe about 45 minutes before we started it. So if you have an age stated whiskey and you're really wanting to dive into the tasting notes of, of, of your whiskey, you can always do a, a small little rule of thumb is for every year your whiskey is aged, spend a minute just waiting in the glass. Let it sit for 18 minutes, for example, before you start making a judgment. Because your, 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 your alcohol needs to settle, it needs to open up a little bit, and that's when you're really going to see what it, the whiskey can do. So this is our, this is our Highland example. Does anybody have a favorite so far? The first one in the couple yeah. spots, nice. Yeah, and, blend. and the third one. Awesome. Right on. Yeah, the third one's yeah. Cool. Okay, so continue on. We're jumping down to an island, technically, of Campbelltown. Maybe it's a peninsula. Uh, Campbelltown once was the most booming region of Scotland where I think there was at least over 30 distilleries and they were going hard and they were making a lot of really delicious whiskies according to the lore because of course I wasn't around for that. There's only three distilleries now in, in Campbelltown uh, and Glen Scotia is one of them. Springbank is another and Springbank also I believe runs Glen Guile Distillery which which operates under Kilcarran. Um, those whiskeys are available in Alberta, um, and they 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 release some pretty awesome stuff. But uh, but Glen Scotia is our whiskey of the the evening for for, for Campbelltown, and they're owned by Loch Lomond. I don't know a heck of a lot about Glen Scotia, except that everything that they've done has had what is what is known as the Campbelltown funk. Um, with, with it not being available in Manitoba and so much whiskey is available, I only get to try it through Mike. So Mike, if you wanted to add anything about Glen Scotia, please do. Um, <laughs> 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 
I'll, I'll, I'll say I that there is. I do a, know that the distillery apparently, if you go there, it looks very, very, very run down. It's full. Um, that's all I know. Okay. Well, this this particular whiskey is the Victoriana. It's a it's founded in 1832, so it's another one of those darn old whiskey <laughs> distilleries. Um, the Victoriana is kind of an homage to their Victoriana Victorian days of when there were a lot of distilleries operating in, in Campbelltown. Um, Campbelltown is 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 it's known to have a distinct flavor uh, called the Campbelltown Funk. Uh, and that's one of those kind of old, just consider it old, like a musty, dank. I, the very first Glen Scotia I had uh, was at our gala in our first year. Uh, so in November, typically, we have a really awesome event where there's tens of thousands of whiskeys. Uh, at a nice wet restaurant kind of thing where you dress up and you, you yeah. do all that kind of stuff. And we had one yeah. and, and the description bad. of the whiskey there were only, there were only was not much ten worse. Ten <laughs> so you get this really dank, dusty, mushroomy type of flavor from some Campbelltown whiskeys. But to be honest, this one, they're using heavily charred barrels. And I think that might eliminate some of that mustiness, and it really is deceiving and and, and kind of takes you away from Campbelltown a little bit on this particular one, maybe holding a little bit of that 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 Campbelltown funk. And of course, this is cast strength as well. Uh, of course, all the all the distilleries in in Campbelltown are small, uh, and and. and they, they have a, a really neat cult following. Springbank being one where every time they release something, you can't get something from Springbank unless you you win a lottery. Uh, you know, save for their, their 10 year old or their 15 year old. Those are kind of their readily available bottles, but not so readily. Uh, it's one of the only distilleries that's family owned. So now we're drinking Glen Scotia, but I know more about Springbank. Um, they, they're owned by the Mitchell family, where Springbank is, is neat. They, they cover a whole lot of ground. They have their peated uh, core range Springbank expressions. Uh, their 15 is great, their 10 is, is such an excellent value. If you, can, if you see a, a Springbank 10, you get it. And that might be one of those things for Cat. If you want to know what a waxy whiskey is, Springbank 10 has that waxiness as well. Uh, they dabble in peat on all of their whiskeys, but they also have a fully peated line called Long Row. And they're also another distillery that takes after Akintosh and where they triple distill their whiskeys maybe a couple weeks or something out of the year until they've got enough whiskey triple distilled under their Hazelburn brand. All three of those brands from Springbank are absolutely phenomenal. Uh, it's unlike any type of peat that you've tried from Isla when you're trying a long row. Uh, and their triple distilled whiskeys are still big and beautiful. And they do a lot of really cool cask finishes or cask maturations where they're, they focus a lot on those sherry barrels uh, or port or even red wine. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of things going on at Springbank that makes it really difficult to get because everybody in the entire world wants it and they'll pay for it so it's expensive too but they go from their 10 15 they have a 12 year old cask strength they have a 21 year old 25 year olds uh, and then single barrels they even have a society where you can become a member and get access to single barrels and hand filled stuff it's crazy uh, and, and Glen Scotia being a neighbor to them, they they are kind of just kind of dwarfed by Springbank's popularity, and that's why they're awesome because we can get it for cheaper, and we can get some extremely good Campbelltown whiskeys uh, without fighting people to get it. So Victoriana, Glen Scotia. Can't wait. All right now. Whoa. Oh, and feel free if you want to take pictures of everything, including me. Please no. Uh, share. 
share the Instagramming and all that kind of crap. Tag me in right? the club. Do, you want to Do the Instagram and then we get people the wanting to come out to drink whiskey, okay? Um, oh yeah, you just have to come to some heavy metal shows and that's easy. So they rock, man. Yeah, yeah just the There's the club. That's why he's gone great, because he's aged him. <laughs> okay. We're, we're hitting, a, hitting a region of the islands, which is so condensed with distilleries, they decided to give it its own region within the highlands, which is Speyside. So many good distilleries exist in Speyside. Um, most of the commercial ones like Glenlivet and Glenfiddich, you know, the ones that you don't even have to know about whiskey to know about the name of those ones because they have the, the commercials. They're the only brands that actually have commercials. Um, they're located in the space side and space side is really neat because they have so much variety that sometimes you, you, you all whiskey you can't you can't ever really say that it's an isla because it's peated or it's a sherry whiskey because it's highland there's there's no rules when it comes to flavor profiles except for you know isla really does a lot of peated whiskeys, but there's unpeated yeah. ones there too. Speyside and the Highlands are harder to decipher because all of those distilleries could still be using a, a portion of, of peat uh, to, to peat their barley and dry it out, which will give you an essence of smoke, it'll give you an essence of that peat, but it's not the, the main character. The barrels typically are going to be sherry, uh, sherry barrels, but the majority are going to be aging in those in those bourbon barrels. So Macallan, though, is our offering for the space side tonight. We also have another beautiful, beautiful sherry whiskey here from Glenallachie, uh, both space side distilleries. Um, so when we're talking space side, we're thinking sherry, right? Uh, but Ben Romick exists and they peat their whiskeys and they peat some seriously good peated whiskeys. Uh, so it's all about the parts per million of how much peat they're using to dry their barley. And, and if we're talking, you know, once we, once we finish this one, that's when the peat is gonna enter our tasting. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the peat right now because it's, it's a source of, of heat so it's a source to dry things, and when you when you germinate your your malted barley on a floor uh, to 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 achieve those sugars that you need to ferment them, you're going to dry them with whatever is the most common and easiest thing to access when you're in Scotland, and that's peat. Uh, peat is a old old centuries to thousands of years old vegetal mud that's just decomposed and gained all of this quality uh, of flavors and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a source of heat where you can light it and set your fires with it or use the smoke to inherit some flavors into your barley. So, you know, the Macallan, of course, you know, if they're gonna peat their whiskey or dry some of their barley with peat, it's not going to be detectable because it's such a small amount that as soon as it's dry, it's out of there. You can find distilleries like Glen Goyne, which is another Highland distillery, where they just use air. They just wait, they just lay it out and let the air do the drying for them. So that's zero peat. Um, but most of the distilleries in Speyside are going to use at least a little bit and it's not going to be detectable mainly because of the sherry cask influence uh, where you're going to see a lot of red fruits and all these beautiful things that come from your, your fortified wine casks. So Macallan is one of those po polarizing distilleries where you know you, you either love it or hate it. If you're rich then you love it because they're all expensive, you know. Uh, but if you, if you closed your eyes and just drank a Macallan, and you're a sherry whiskey fan, you're gonna like it, you know, especially if you didn't have to pay for it. So this is the, this is one of their offerings. 
this is the classic cut. This is one of our higher proof Macallans. Macallans one of those distilleries where you know you're paying a, high, a top dollar for them, but they they do proof down their whiskeys to 43%, and it's like okay, it's it's great, but where's where's the rest of your whiskey? Because it is it is really good. Um, so this is a this is a version of them where you're getting a lot of that. You're getting a younger whiskey because it's a non-age statement, and when you see no age, they don't really have an advertisable age to advertise, right? You know, 12 years old is where they start adding their age statements to it. Uh, but there's only one whiskey and it's sitting at 43%, that's a full sherry cask. That's the 12 year old sherry cask. Otherwise they're using ex-bourbon and European oak and they're all seasoned with sherry. So when you think Macallan, you think sherry. They own a, a bodega in Spain. So they have access to their own bespoke casks. They have full control over what barrels they use for their whiskeys. Uh, and of course, they're, all, they're typically always sherry uh, expressions. So even if they're using an American oak, which is an ex-bourbon cask or a virgin oak, American oak cask, they're putting sherry in it first, and then they want their whiskey to hang out in that cask after. So all Macallans are typically sherry whiskeys. Oloroso is usually the the one you can assume they're using. There's a hell of a lot of sherries out there, and Oloroso and Pedro Jimenez are the top, uh, mo maybe most available <coughs> sherries uh, that you can get barrels from. Uh, and and the drier, less sweet sherries typically come from Oloroso. So, me knowing that this isn't a super sweet whiskey, you can assume that it's probably going to be Oloroso, even though they don't tell you. So this is the Macallan Classic Cut, it's a Speyside Distillery. One more little tidbit of information because the rich folk love Macallans. The most expensive Scotch whiskey in the world that's ever been sold at auction was a six-year-old version of Macallan. I think it's what was it 1929 or something uh, distilled in 1929 uh, 1.9 million dollars is what it sold for and if you go <coughs> pardon me <laughs> if you if you google uh top selling whiskeys mccallan out of the 10 there's eight mccallans out of the 10 whiskeys they don't take top spot though in fact an irish whiskey actually takes top spot of the most but it was only $100,000 more at $2 million. So McAllen's are selling for millions and millions of dollars. This one is 150 bucks. Uh, and it's pretty good. Yeah, it's very good. Right? So you're gonna get a nice a nice cast strength version of a, of a space side uh, in, through a McAllen. Classic that one. Yeah. Well, realm of Pete. Yay. Now, Talisker is not normally a distillery that is like known for their heavily peated whiskeys. However, this one turns out to be one of their smokiest, peatiest whiskeys. This is uh, this is an island distillery, so one of those unofficial regions. Learn it. Talisker is on the Isle of Skye. For the longest time, it was actually the only distillery. Now Torbreg. Tor uh, is a, a, an, an another distillery that's on on the Isle of Skye, but is not really available yet. Uh, and also, Rasse is uh, is another Skye region distillery. But Talisker is the one that you need to know about. Um, another one of those distilleries uh, that Diageo owns, so it might find its way into certain blends. Uh, but on its own, it's this beautiful seaside type of salt and pepper type of distillery. They have a really cool, distinct peppery note. The, the Isle of Skye itself is, is rough terrain. It's just constantly getting bombarded by waves. Uh, even the distillery itself is just it's right on the, or on the sea and it just gets hammered by waves. So they like to say that their whiskeys impart a lot of that really cool seaside salty air. 
So it's a savory whiskey. Um, this particular one spends a lot of time, it's, it's whole time in bourbon barrels. Uh, it's cask strength and it's one of the special releases. They release something every year. And uh, lately, I believe this might have been the first one where they started doing all these crazy cartoon style characters <laughs> on it. We've got the Leviathan, the uh, crazy sea monster. Uh, on this particular one, I think the one that's in stores now in Manitoba has this really nice little beautiful jellyfish on it. And the next one has a sailor on a boat and all this kind of jazz. Uh, so lots of really cool artwork with the Diageo releases, but they have a, a, a range of classic malts and they have really awesome distilleries under their portfolio. Um, you know, Talisker, Oban, Dalwini, Kalila, Glen Kinchy, um, Lagavulin, Kleinlish. Kleinlish is a huge one. Um, the list goes on, uh, and they all do distillers editions too, which are which are really neat. They'll take their they'll take their core range bottling and finish them in a fancy sherry cask of many different varieties. The Talisker. Uh, that's available in, in town. We have the, I believe it's the Dark Storm is available, or, or Talisker Storm, which is a, one of the peatier versions. They're 10 year olds, and their Distiller's Edition, which is a 10 year old with that finishing of that special cask. It's an Amoroso cask from Tal Talisker. Uh, and then, of course, their Special Editions. So this is a cast strength expression. Typically, Talisker, I think, is bottling their whiskeys at 45.8%, um, which is a neat number, but I guess there's some science behind it. Um, and, this, and this one is, is from their, their peated stock, like more peated whiskeys uh, coming from this one. So a little bit about Peat in general, because we're going to start really just jumping into the serious stuff here. Peat is measured in parts per million. And that's a basically just a, a, a method of measurement to see how long it's spent its time under peat smoke, the barley. The barley <coughs> has spent its time under the peat smoke. So we can expect probably, without it being advertised, probably 20 to 30 parts per million for this one. This Laphroaic here is 35. If you get into some of the seriously peated whiskies, namely Octomore, that part per million, is, and that's kind of where everybody started to pay attention to parts per million is when the Octomore started to advertise that they're using parts per million on their, on their whiskey bottles. They get into the high hundreds to two hundreds. So that could scare you away or intrigue you. And then it'll surprise you that it's not all that crazily more peated than something like a Lefroy. So very medicinal, very, very vegetal, campfire coals and embers and, and wet wood that's being charred and all these beautiful neat campfire type stuff. You can expect from these last two. Uh, with the with the addition of some <clears throat> salinity from uh, from this talisker, so I hope you enjoy. James, Joel. thank you as always for an extremely <coughs> knowledgeable presentation, and uh, of course appreciate uh, your guidance. Curious, what would you recommend for folks that aren't big fans of peat like yourself? You said you're a big peat head. What what words of wisdom do you have for folks that are embarking on this uh, next few bottles? Who I don't have that palate attenuated to it just quite yet. Well, I'm glad you asked that question. You could always, so a, a neat thing that you could do with, with kind of any whiskey that you don't particularly like, you can make cocktails, first off. Uh, a smoky Caesar, for example, is a really cool take on a Caesar, because you don't really get that, you'll, you know, you can, you can relate a lot of the smoky whiskeys to um, jerky or smoked meats, right? So if you're, if, you're, if you're drinking a Caesar and you want a slab of bacon as one of the garnishes, you could use Talisker. 
Um, if you if you are a fan of oysters, pour a drop of Talisker on top of your oyster before you take a to take it. You know, down your gullet, right? Um, but another thing you could do, which is really really a neat experiment, and and you know if you don't particularly like this sample, anybody here. If you want to take one of our sherry whiskeys and throw a couple drops in it, you can hype up a peated whiskey and make your own blend. There's no rules. Once it's your whiskey, you can do whatever you want with it. We don't have we don't have that. Uh, you know, we're not we're not snobby enough to tell you that you have to do anything to your whiskey. So you can do whatever you want. Um, so you can. Sorry. What the whiskey cost? <laughs> the whiskey cost. Well, they'll we'll have to pay forty-five bucks to get in. So if they're willing to, then they're uh, they'll have to do whatever they want. But I, but, but I, I really do recommend doing some experimentation with uh, with whiskeys that uh, might not be a successful purchase if you're not a fan of what you've bought. Uh, do some experiments. Take one of your whiskeys that you really do like and, and ratio out certain amounts of that whiskey to see if it enhances it. Because you, you might find a quality in a whiskey uh, that is, that's there, but then the rest of the whiskey is not so great. So you can always hype it up with a whiskey that covers up those qualities uh, or enhances them. So hopefully that helps. I, I think a, a, an idea that we were spitballing was uh, was taking some peated whiskeys and, and literally adding stuff to it. You know, you've got barrel influence all the time, sherry whiskeys that have that influence. But you could take a fortified wine and blend it with your whiskey. You're gonna proof it down a little bit, but you're also gonna add that flavor. So buy a bottle of sherry and throw some sherry in your cask strength whiskeys too, and see what goes down. It's a, there's no rules. Exactly, you can make an infinity bottle as well. I don't necessarily recommend taking your orchard house and then mixing it with a whole bunch of peated whiskeys because you'll have no idea that this exists in a, in a, in a peated bowl. That's my filler. Right? But, uh, and, and that was my mistake first. I, I had old Pulte 17 and it was just, this. it was the beginning of a beautiful infinity bottle and then I said, hard bag Oogadal and I put a whole ounce in there and I was like, oh, now it just tastes like Oogadal and I can't taste any other whiskeys I put in here. Yeah, if I had that, I'd use it for whiskey. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. There's, you know, a smoky sour, like a whisk, a take on a whiskey sour is awesome. You know, and it might, it might, if you're, if you're not a fan of peat, which some people aren't. You know, if you if you make a cocktail that has that that hint of peat, you're kind of training yourself to start to like it, and eventually you're gonna like every whiskey that we show you because we're showing you all of the available whiskeys that there are. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm on it. Well, this is the first introduction to peat on this. Technically, yeah. Maybe the Glen Scotia had a little bit, but not as much as the Glen. It's only eight words. I think I think you can find that out all by yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The more the more water you add, the more you proof it down. Uh, and if it's and if it's too much, yeah, open it up a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the the alcohol strength is is kind of what we look for when we're choosing our whiskeys. So the higher strength is is typically going to have the most flavor. This is a really I'm looking for something I don't have. Like, well, I'm not going to say what my favorite is. Yeah. What's in your collection that you're looking at? And then the great part about the movie we're going to watch. My last step, DJ. Next time again. Next time again. I don't. I don't think There's I have any. There's more than an allergy for you. I don't. <laughs> so, Lafroig is the reason I'm standing here. Uh, it was. This is this is my favorite distillery. 
uh, is the reason I have been so obsessed with scotch ever since I've started, uh, ever since my first sip of Lafroy Porter Cask. Uh, I named my daughter Isla because it made me so obsessed. Um, this is Lafroy 10 year old cask strength. This is batch 15. The first one that I ever had was uh, the 007. And, uh, and that was really, really what got me into cast strength whiskeys because before that it was, I just didn't know what I was buying. Uh, but, but I focused on the cast strength whiskeys and, and what, they, what they brought to the table from Lefroy 10 cast strength. So that was, that was about seven years ago. Um, what I think with this particular whiskey is Lefroy is taking some of their, their barrels, their particularly best barrels, and they're reserving it for the 10 year old cask strength as opposed to the 10 year old that's always available. It's at 43% alcohol. Um, and, and they use Maker's Mark bourbon barrels for all of their, their whiskeys, unless they state that it's a different style of, of, of barrel. Uh, they, they share either whiskeys as well. Uh, so we're talking about Isla is our last region. Isla is always typically the last region because peat sticks to your palate and really affects everything you taste there on after. Uh, so because we had a lot of delicate whiskies and more sherry whiskies, the peat always goes at the end in the tasting. Um, Lefroy founded in 1815. They just had in 2015, it was when I started drinking Scotch whiskey. Uh, it was their 200 year anniversary. Uh, the year next was 2016 and Lagavulin, one of their neighbors, had their 200 year anniversary. So a little history on Lefroy is they started off producing whiskies to supply to Lagavulin as part of their whiskey portfolio and their blends. Where, so Lefroy was basically making this really excellent whiskey and Lagavulin was selling it for them because they were buying it from them and branding it under their name. Well, when Lefroy realized that Lagavulin was doing really well selling whiskey, they stopped selling it to them and started making their own and putting it under their own name, which turned into a little bit of a feud between the two distilleries, they're neighbors on Isla. Isla has, I think, nine distilleries. There's a couple popping up that changes the, uh, of course, the total number. Um, but there's three core distilleries at the south peninsula of Isla: Lefroy, Ardbeg, and Lagavulin. They're all neighbors. You could walk to all three distilleries in one day. Um, so Lagavulin being right beside Lefroy, when they stopped selling whiskey to them, they tried to figure out why they needed Lefroy's whiskey so badly when their whiskey was excellent, but it was just not the same. And they kind of gathered that it was maybe their water source. So there's a river that runs through a whole peat bog, which is going to inherit lots of peat flavors and is gonna to contribute to the flavors of the whiskey. Uh, and it goes straight to the Lefroy distillery. Well, back in the day, I don't know what year it was, <clears throat> Lagavulin said, well, screw you guys. You're not gonna sell our whiskey. We're gonna take your water. And they di diverted the river from Lefroy distillery to the Lagavulin distillery. Masters. Yeah. <laughs> so Lagav or, you know, Lefroy dries up all of a sudden and is wondering why. <laughs> and uh, find out that Lagavulin has done such a thing. So Le Lefroy does something that no other distillery really has had to do, and they bought a gigantic portion of land that the river was on. So now they own the river. <laughs> so they re-diverted it back to their, to their <laughs> distillery, and now Lagavulin is going to have to fend for themselves for their water source, and Lefroy gets their water source back. And that's why we have the Friends of Flor uh, Lefroy, and you have your foot by foot, yep. square inch of Lefroy owned <laughs> land, because, you know, what else are they gonna do with land? 
that they don't use except for the one river that's on it. So that's, that's a little neat little tidbit of Lafroig info for you. Um, yeah, Lafroig, Lafroig and Lagavulin and Nardbeg, they're, they're the, the, the really peated distilleries, uh, the ones that are, you know, the big three, if you will, on Isla. Uh, Bowmore, of course, is an excellent distillery. All of the distilleries on Isla, Kilholman, Gunahaven, uh, you know, you have, you have, you have a lot going on there in the realm of peat, but those three are the ones that really kick you in the teeth. Uh, and it's the parts per million. Again, you know, the, the measurement of peat that they're using. Lafroig and Lagavulin. Lagavulin obviously wants to be a lot like Lafroig because they do exactly the same. 35 parts per million. Ardbeg does 55 parts per million, which is interesting because this one here I think Lafroig is the most potent. You know, Ardbeg and all peated whiskies are certainly potent whiskies. <clears throat> Something about Lafroig, you know, they were the they were the only distillery from Scotland that was allowed to be served in the 1913s to 33 and during Prohibi prohibition, right? They were they were medicinal. And and they used Lafroy. People were people were prescribed Lafroy for the common cold for hot toddies or what have you. Well, who knows what? Maybe you just have to have a shot and go to bed. Maybe it helps you go to bed because you got a head cold, right? Who knows why they prescribed Scotch whiskey uh, for you know for, as the only thing that was available alcohol-wise during Prohibition. Uh, Lafroy has their their friends of Lafroy, and if you're a friend, you're a friend for life. If you're, you know, you're if you're not, you're probably never going to like Lafroy. Um, but they're known for their medicinal and band aid and all of these really iodine. interesting iodine and and just just interesting characteristics coming from their peat. Um, to that point. Uh, when you when you peat your barley, it's going to be very very potent and very peaty and smoky. So no whiskey here is using barley that is 100% peated. They're they, they're going to have to balance their whiskies out with unpeated malt to a, an extent. Lafroy might not admit it, or they might not do it as much as others because they're that peaty and that potentially offensive to some of his palate. Uh, but there is going to be some malt that doesn't have that full-on peat characteristic to, to balance it out a little bit. Otherwise, you're just going to be chewing on a piece of burnt wood, right? So Lafroy is our last distillery. This is, this is the, the batch 15. It's still available in stores. It's about $135 uh, before tax. And, and honestly, you know, for a 10-year-old whiskey, it's just so good. It's just so perfect. And I'm a little bit biased, but I think uh, I think this particular batch, because they, of course, batches are going to vary as well. Uh, this one might might surprise you in the level of sweetness, um, and maybe if, you know if uh, if it was something that we had done blind, you might even think it was a peated sherry whiskey. But it's not. It's all bourbon barrel. <clears throat> Joel. Isn't there some crazy shit in the bottle that says on the Lafroy cast strength you're supposed to mix it like two to one water to whiskey? Oh wow. Yeah, they've been doing that for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we recommend you add a small amount of water to your whiskey to small? fully. They're not doing it on this one. Oh no? Ah. It's, it's I thought, stopped I on batch it was... 14. Mm -hmm. It's not on that one. Yeah. You're it's right. Like, you used to say some weird shit on yeah, that. Yeah. From 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 two batch 07. Water to one ounce that of whiskey. One yeah. yeah. Two I parts tried to it. one. I tried it, it was fucking weird. <laughs> it is weird. It, it, it brings you to Lafroig Select at 40% ABV or something crazy, right? Um, yeah, it, it normally did say that. This one is the first time I'm reading the back of this label. It actually just says a small amount of water. Oh, I thought it'd be like more reading. Interesting. It up. Um, so so maybe they were criticized a little too much the last seven years. I'm curious if you buy that and you proof it down to the regular proof of Lafroig 10 with distilled water, would it be cheaper? Then Lafroy 10? Probably not. I wonder, it's 43% for the regular one. 
It's 58.6. 56.5, sorry. I don't know, I'm not a mathematician. Uh, that's a tough one. 135 <laughs> compared to 79. That's you know, you pay 40, 40 extra dollars or 50 extra dollars for this one. Yeah. It's 40% less. The, the, the difference with. Uh, Is it the same juice at a different proof? Well, it's the same. It's the same distillate, but I'm thinking that they're using different barrels that are selected for these ten-year-old whiskeys are going to be part of the the cask strength series, okay. and the other yeah. ones, the, maybe the lesser barrels, are going to get proofed down and go into the core range, which is mass produced. Right. Where yeah, this one is sense. allocated, you know, th this is one of my favorite whiskeys, so I recommend if you like this one, go buy it. Because the liquor marks, you know, they they only bring in whiskeys according to numbers. So if we don't sell a lot of Lafroy 10 cask strength, we're not going to see it next year or the year next. So if you like it, do me a favor and get it because I love it and I want to see this all the time. And it's the cheapest place in Canada to it's get the it too. Place in Canada. Yeah, yeah. buy anywhere. No, it's Alberta. twenty. It's, it's fifteen. Fifteen dollars more expensive in Alberta, plus ten dollars shipping. Products. Twenty-five bucks more. Oh, they're, they're cheap. What's the cheapest place in Canada? Is it still in stock decently, or what? That's my first one. What? <laughs> it stopped me in my tracks. This is one of the best whiskeys I've ever had in my life.